democratic power we also have to try to develop ourselves. This will serve as a motivation for much of what I intend to talk about. So uh, the statement is that for every rational number p over q in reduced form, there is a unique periodic orbit under the doubling map of the circle with that rotation number p over q. And this is an example where p over q is 2 fifth, and that is the unique cycle, uh, 5 over 31, <coughs> 10 over 20, goes to 9, goes to 18, goes back to 5. And of course, we know that this 5 cycle uh, is related to the dynamical rates uh, that land at the parabolic fixed point uh, for the quadratic polynomial, which has the corresponding multiply. So these five, the angles of these five rays correspond to these four angles. And similarly, for every irrational number theta, there is a unique compact invariant set, which turns out to be a counter set, whose rotation number under the Delman map is theta. So this time, we have a counter set. Uh, my sets are subsets of the circle, but for better visibility, I show you the hyperbolic convex hull, so you can see the angle. But they live on the circle. So there is a counter set, which actually lives in a semi-circle, bounded by some angle omega over 2, <coughs> over 2 plus 1 half. This is an example where theta is the golden mean, and you can compute, oops, you can compute this, this angle. Omega, it's a transcendental number, but it's computable. And for this good rotation number, it is well known that the, that counter set corresponds to the angles of the dynamical rays that land on the boundary. And as a matter of fact, this correspondence, we know about it for almost every rotation number, but it's not a full correspondence in this sense for every rotation number. And it is well known that these so-called rotation sets, whether you're looking at the rational ones or irrational ones, they have something to do with the external rays of the matterboard set, the ones that land on the boundary of the main cardioid. So if you take the P over Q wall here, the two rays landing on it, the angles, you can find them in the corresponding rotation set. And for the irrational case, uh, that angle omega is exactly the angle of the external ray that lands at the corresponding Siegel parameter. So the motivation uh, for this project was to extend this to higher degrees. So of course, uh, we can ask, what do I mean by that? So this uh, has two parts. Uh, you can think about this parallel abstractly, trying to generalize uh, the theory of rotation sets uh, to higher degrees, uh, understand the structure of rotation sets under multiplication by dmap. So d is a fixed integer integer their topological properties, metric properties, dynamics on them, how, how many of uh, such rotation sets you can find given the, the rotation number, uh, how can you parametrize them, all sorts of questions. And then there's a concrete part, uh, realizing such abstract rotation sets in suitable spaces of degree D polynomial. For example, can we find families of polynomials such that when we look at the parameter space, we can find a complete catalog of all possible rotation sets. So this is a list of some earlier work in this area. It's not a very long list. And I apologize if I'm missing something here. As a matter of fact, I wasn't aware of a couple of these uh, papers until very recently. Uh, so, uh, of course, we're all familiar with the original work of Goldberg and Milner in the early 90s, uh, who 
characterized rational quotation sets under multiplication by P map and used it in their theory of fixed point portraits of polynomials. So that was a seminal work that uh, led to uh, a lot of work in the subsequent decade. There is a paper by Bullock and Centenac on quotation sets under doubling, inspired by ideas of duality. Uh, so they basically characterize uh, such quotation sets. They talk about rational and irrational cases and some number theoretic results. Then there is this uh, work of Goldberg and uh, Tresser that is more or less the irrational version of Goldberg and Milner. They Yes, the first paper has multiplicity too. Okay. So there are two papers in there. Okay. There are two parts. <laughs> but the, the origin is a bit is right. Long. Right, right. There is part one by Goldberg and part two by Goldberg and Miller. I just wanted to save time. <laughs> um, so this work uh, studies irrational rotation sets. And it gives a characterization, a parameterization for them. Uh, but it's a, a very abstract language of, uh, in terms of fairy trees. Um, ten years later, this paper appeared. And I recently discovered this paper uh, by uh, Sasha Bloch and uh, his co authors. They uh, begin to develop some general theory for rotation sets of, of DPT under multiplication by D. They study some basic uh, topological uh, properties, uh, but their main focus is how to go from degree D to one degree higher or lower by some topological surgery on the circle. And then there is this recent paper. I'm sorry, these keys are so small and close to one another. Uh, I keep messing it up. Where was it? Uh, this is a preprint that uh, came out last year. They study uh, self uh, antibody preserving cubic maps, and uh, in doing so, they have to study some rotation sets under angle tripling map. And this was actually the last paper was my motivation because exactly at the same time, my main motivation was to look at the space of cubic polynomials with a fixed Siegel disk of a given rotation number, this uh, uh, one dimensional slice. And to each such Siegel disk, you can attach a counter set. And I was wondering how these counter sets change as you uh, move around the parameter space, and then exactly at the same time I was visiting IMS at Stony Brook, I realized that Jack uh, and uh, Xavier and Araceli were thinking about similar ideas, and mostly in the rational case, but it was in the same spirit. So I was very much motivated by uh, their work um, in this last paper. So, what I want to do is, uh, to the best of my ability in the remaining, uh, hopefully 50 something minutes, to give you a very elementary account of the abstract part and give you some snapshots of uh, how it links to polynomials, mostly for the cubic maps. And hopefully this is going to be elementary and quite accessible, especially for uh, student audience. All right. So let me start from the scratch. Let's establish some notation. Throughout this discussion, D is a, is a fixed integer where they're equal to 2. M sub D is the multiplication by D map on the circle. So M sub D takes an angle T and multi multiplies it by D mod 1. Uh, and we have the definition of a rotation set. Uh, a rotation set is a compact non-empty subset of the circle, which is invariant under multiplication by D. 
with the additional but important property that the restriction of MD to this compact set uh, can be extended to a degree one monotone map of the set. So what this essentially means is that multipli multiplication by D acts on uh, uh, on the subset in an order preserving fashion. So if you take any triple in your set, its image on the multiplication by D will have the same uh, cyclic order, except that you allow pairs to get identified. Uh, every side set by classical theory of Poincaré has a well-defined rotation number. You just take the, any monotone extension and uh, degree one monotone map of the set is a well-defined rotation number. The definition is exactly like the case of Poincaré. So the rotation number of x, I'm going to denote it by rho of x, and I'm going to think of it as an as a as an angle between zero and one. Uh, simple example. In degree three, it's a three cycle, seven over 26 maps to 21 over 26, maps to 11 over 26, maps to seven. Uh, the rotation number is two third. And this is the graph of, so the one in blue is the graph of the angle tripling map. And you have your three cycle here. So this point goes to this point, goes back to this point, and it goes to and the red curve is just a typical generic monotone extension of the angle tripling map restricted to this uh, three cycle. So as you can see, you have a lot of freedom in choosing this extension. So to bring some order to this construction, uh, uh, I'll be choosing a very standard monotone extension. So I'll talk about this construction very soon. So we usually choose a particular monotone extension uh, of this form. So it's uh, essentially piecewise half line with slope three and zero. Now, uh, we're really talking about negligible subsets of the circle here. Um, every rotation set is necessarily an over net can't have any interior because it's invariant under multiplication by D. Uh, whereas if you pick a random point on the circle, because multiplication by D is ergodic, the orbit of the randomly chosen point is dense. So it immediately follows that the union of all rotation sets of a given degree has measured zero. Not only for a fixed rotation number, but you consider all of them put them together, they still have measures here. Does it have absolute dimensions? I don't know. That's a very good question. I think is, it it that, is it another paper that will sign? What I know is that a given rotation set has absolute, has absolute dimension zero. This is a very old result of uh, Peter Bierman. But maybe you know about. Yeah, there is a paper that. Um, analogous to a result of Berman in series on simple curves. Okay. So that, that's the uh, curve is confirming that the union has those types of dimensions. Yes. All right. Uh, I hope you can settle the next conjectures. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, so, it turns out that, that in order to understand the rotation set, you should look at its complement. Uh, so throughout this discussion, x is a rotation set under multiplication by d. So every connected component of the complement is called a gap. It's an open segment. Uh, we're going to classify gaps as minor or major, depending on their length. If they're too short, they're called minor. It's a, rather long, they're called major, and the condition is exactly this. So the gap is minor if its length is less than 1 over d, otherwise it's major, and it's clear where 1 over d comes from. So a minor gap under multiplication by d maps homeomorphically onto its image, whereas a major gap wraps around the circle. At least once. Uh, now, 
If I have a major gap, I can uh, take a look at its uh, length. Uh, I call it a taut gap, and I borrowed this terminology from the paper of uh, Block and uh, co-authors. So I call it a taut gap if its length is uh, a, an integer multiple of one of the d. So that means under multiplication by d, a taut gap maps an exact number of times. So wraps around the circle an exact number of times. And uh, if it's not of this form, I call it a loose gap. That means under multiplication by d, you go around at least once around the circle, and then there is a leftover. And the multiplicity of a gap is the integer part of d times its length. Essentially, it's the number of times you cover the circle. Now, let me quickly explain what the standard uh, monotone extension that I showed you in the, in the previous slide works. You take any monotone extension whatsoever, and you start modifying it on major gaps. So you leave it alone on minor gaps, uh, well, you can define it to be the multiplication by d if it's not, but on, uh, on, a, on a minor gap, you define it to be multiplication by d. On a major gap, you can define it, well, that is the definition, on a major gap of length L of the form A, A plus L, you define it like this, but it's much easier to explain it in the picture. So imagine that this is a major gap, yeah? A to A plus D, and these blue lines, which are rather hard to see, part of the graph of multiplication by D. So what you do is, on this major gap, you replace an arbitrary extension by this map. So you, de you define it to be constant as much as you can, and then for the, for the leftover, you, de you just follow the multiplication by D. So this way, you can modify uh, any monotone extension on major gaps, and after finding many such modifications, you end up with the graph of a monotone extension, which looks like this. It's just a piecewise affine map. So this is the graph of, say, uh, part of the graph of the uh, lift. So it's piecewise affine with slopes d and zero. But note that from the previous construction, when you do this, on every major gap of multiplicity n, you create a plateau of length n over d. So the plateaus in this graph, all of them come from major gaps where a major gap of multiplicity n contributes a plateau of length n over d. Now this immediately proves the following theorem that uh, an arbitrary rotation set as d minus one major gaps counting multiplicities. Well, I'm assuming it's not a single point. So my assumption was that rotation number is not zero. Why is that? Well, take a look at the complement of these plateaus. Uh, obviously, the complement of these plateaus has length one over d. So the sum of the lengths of the plateaus is 1 minus 1 over d. So you get the sum of the multiplicities divided by n is 1 minus 1 over d. So you get the sum of the multiplicities is d minus 1. Very elementary. So this should be thought of as an abstract analog of the fact that the polynomial of the d is d minus 1 for the moments. And as a matter of fact, in uh, the work of uh, Goldberg and Milner, there is, I mean, this thing is actually, there is a link. Okay, so we can also understand how gaps are mapped around under any monotone extension. So when I talk about the orbit of a gap, I'm not talking about the orbit of a gap under multiplication by d, but rather under the monotone extension, uh, db1 monotone extension. So for example, we can easily see that if we pick any gap, and start mapping it around. Eventually, so two things can happen. Either uh, eventually we hit a plot gap, and then after that, the next image is just a point in your in your uh, rotation set. Or else, this gap must have been periodic to begin with. 
So the statement is that every gap is either periodic or eventually it hits a taut gap. Remember, the taut gap is a major gap whose length is an integer multiple of 1 over d. That means the length is precise enough so that the next image of the multiplication by d wraps around the circle an exact number of times, precisely. So the two ends goes on. Why is that? Well, just look at this uh, uh, diagram. So it's obvious that if I start with a minor gap under uh, iterations, this minor, so every time I apply my map on a minor gap, uh, its length gets stretched by a factor of d. So eventually, after finally many iterates, a minor gap should map to a major gap, which could be, so a minor gap uh, either goes to a major gap which is loose, or it goes to a major gap which is taut. If you land here, there is no next iterate because the image of a taut gap is a point, so the process terminates. If you map to a loose gap, the next iterate could be either minor or major of either type, so the process continues. Now, imagine that you never hit this taut gap. My taut gap disappeared. Imagine you never hit this. So there has to be infinitely many exchanges here. And since there are only finitely many major, uh, major gaps, in particular loose gaps, you're bound to fall into a periodic cycle. But if the, the gap is eventually periodic, it's easy to see that it must be periodic. Essentially because every gap has a unique pre-image. So that's the end of the proof. And an immediate corollary is that if you have an irrational rotation set, namely a rotation set whose rotation number is irrational, then when you pick any gap and keep iterating it, eventually this falls off. Okay. I'll just put it in my way. So if you take any gap, so I'm talking about an irrational rotation set. I pick a gap and I start iterating it under the monotone extension. Eventually I should hit the top gap. And then after that, the next iterate is a point. Because there can't be any periodic gap in an irrational rotation set. The end points would be periodic points. <coughs> So in particular, at least one major gap of any irrational rotation set must be taught. And that is in uh, contrast with rational gaps. OK, so let me now uh, focus on minimal rotation sets. So these are rotation sets which don't have any proper subset, which are also rotation sets. So let x be a minimal rotation set uh, with rotation number theta. If theta is rational of the form p over q in reduced form, then it is clear that x must be a q cycle. And it can be shown that if uh, theta is irrational, this must be a counter set. So we have this dichotomy, either a q cycle or a counter set. Uh, there is a degree one monotone map phi from the circle itself, which we normalize so that phi fixes the origin. Uh, that zero is the angle zero, so it's the point one on the circle, which conjugates the action of multiplication by d on your rotation set with uh, rigid rotation. So r sub theta is the rigid rotation of the circle by angle theta. So we have this, well, I shouldn't have said conjugacy. It's a semi-conjugacy because phi is not one to one with the property that phi uh, is constant on every gap of x. So on the complement of x, each connected component of the complement of x will collapse to a point under this phi. And this essentially with, the, with these properties, if we normalize it, it's unique. And I prefer to this phi as the semi-conjugacy associated with x. Uh, the semi-conjugacy is uh, rather trivial, not very interesting in the rational case. It's just a map that collapses each gap to uh, a q root of unity. 
So if you look at the graph of phi, uh, it's essentially a step function. So the image of each gap is one of the, so this is the, the example where q is 5. So the image of each gap is a q to the fifth. Yeah, fifth to the fifth. But in the irrational case, this is nothing but the famous point for any conjugacy. That's uh, whose construction is well known in uh, theory of circumference. So it's not difficult to construct this map. It's the good old point for any conjugacy. And the graph of it is a uh, double staircase. But the important property to keep in mind is that whether you're in the rational case or the irrational case, phi has the property that it collapses gaps of your uh, of your location set. As a matter of fact, the so the stronger statement is that phi has a plateau, say an interval i, which is the maximal interval in which phi is constant, if and only if i is a gap. So once we consider this semi-conjugacy, we can uh, find a natural measure that lives on uh, our rotation set. Uh, it's the unique and the invariant probability measure, which I denote by mu in the case. X is a Q cycle in the rational case. This is nothing but the Dirac measure, the uniform Dirac measure supported on the cycle. And in the case, X is a counter set, so rotation number is irrational. This is just the pullback of Lebesgue measure under the same conditions. So every minimal rotation set comes equipped with a natural measure, probability measure. Now, I need one more ingredient before I can state the result. So multiplication by d on the circle has d minus 1 fixed points, uh, which are located at d minus the first roots of uh, And it's not difficult to show that every major gap of multiplicity n contains exactly n fixed points. This gives you another view on why counting multiplicity, you must have d minus 1 major gaps. So, these are some examples. In degree two, I have only one major gap and one fixed point. Fixed point zero, and there is one major gap of multiplicity one. This is degree three, an example in degree three. I have two fixed points at zero and one half, a pair of major gaps, each of multiplicity one. And this is an example in degree four. I have three fixed points at zero, one third, and two third. I have one major gap of multiplicity one and another major gap of multiplicity two. So these examples illustrate that statement. Are any of those gaps tight? Not in this case, because I, as far as I remember, I mean, I don't draw these by n. These are actually rotation sets, and I think all of them are rational. And if you have a cycle, the gaps are never. So now we have a natural measure living on the rotation set, and we have these d minus one six points equally distributed around the circle. Uh, we can define the so-called deployment vector of x. It's a probability vector, which I, which I denote by delta x. Uh, it has d minus one component. Uh, it's a probability vector in uh, e minus one dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, you can think of it as an element of the standard d minus two dimensional simplex. So these components, uh, delta one through delta d minus one, are defined as follows. The ith component of this vector is the measure of the segment between uh, z i minus one and z i. So you look at the <coughs> d minus one segments between the fixed points, and you measure the mass of the rotation set using the natural measure of the rotation set of each of those segments. So um, 
in the case, so these numbers are all not negative and they add up to one, so it's a probability vector. And what is the dynamical interpretation of these numbers? It's very simple. If you're talking about the cycle, so the rotation number is rational, delta i is just the fraction of the points in your cycle that lie between the two given fixed points. So it specifies how many of your q points in the cycle are between zi minus 1 and zi. And if theta is irrational, you have to replace the that with the frequency of visit because this, this thing is ergodic. So, so delta i uh, would mean dynamically that you take the segments between uh, the i minus first fixed point and i fixed point, you take a look at the segment, you pick any point in your rotation set, and you keep iterating it under multiplication by d, and just you measure the frequency of visit to the center. Uh, note that when theta is rational of the form p over q in uh, lowest terms, the components of delta are all n rational numbers with denominator q. So just fractions of that form. So q times delta is an integer vector. So we have this restriction. Uh, delta can't be arbitrary if theta is rational. The components of the deployment vector must be of this particular form. And now I can state the theorem of Goldberg and Tresser. Uh, Tresser, uh, which says given any admissible pair, theta and delta, where theta is a number on the circle, or in the interval 0, 1, and delta is a, a probability vector in rd minus 1. Admissible here means if theta is of the form q over q, then the components of delta are rational numbers with denominator q. And if theta is irrational, anything is admissible. There is no condition. So given any admissible pair, there is a unique minimal rotation set, x, uh, with the given rotation number and the point of vector. So it turns out that the kind of uniqueness statement that you have in, the, in degree 2 is just, uh, you don't have that uniqueness in higher degrees. Uh, you have uniqueness in degree 2 because the dimension is just too low. So it follows that the space of also, if you fix your rotation number theta, it follows that the space of all minimal rotation sets, uh, that given rotation number theta, is finite if theta is of the form p over q. And that's exactly the number of such uh, cycles. Because according to the theorem, how can you specify them? You have d minus 1 fixed points, so d minus 1 segments around the circle and you have q points and you can assign any number of points in any of these d minus 1 segments. So it's the number of ways you can deploy uh, q balls in d minus 1 boxes, which is exactly that by elementary common points. And this number is 1 if uh, d is 2, and this number is d plus 1 if, uh, sorry, q plus 1 if d is 3 and so on. So it grows with the degree. Uh, with the, yes, with the degree. So if theta is of the form q over q, you have only finite many such uh, minimal rotation sets. And if theta is irrational, this, uh, you have infinite many. It's isomorphic to the simplex, the two-dimensional simplex. Now, the simplex is reduces to a point when these two, and it's an interval when these three. So in the cubic case, it's an interval. And uh, I'm going to show you the picture of that interval. So. so let's take a look at this example in the cubic case. So d is 3. Uh, so according to the theorem, so what's going on? In the case d is 3, I have 2 fixed points at 0 and 1 half. So two intervals between them. So if my rotation number is 2 thirds, uh, I'm allowed to put three points in my cycle 
in any way I want in these uh, two boxes, in this uh, partition consisting of two segments. And there are four different ways of doing that. So either I can put all of them downstairs, or one up and two down, or two up and one down, or all of them upstairs. And these are the actual angles that you can compute. The, I just put the numerator. Everything is a multiple of 1 over 26. So this cycle, so there are exactly four three cycles under tripling and the angle tripling map uh, with rotation number 2 thirds. And I call them A, B, C, and D with the corresponding deployment vectors. So, by the way, let's uh, make a quick correction here. My examples from this point on, uh, especially in the dynamical context, for simplicity, they're cubic. So D is three. So the deployment vector has two components, and they add up to one. So if the first component is A, the next one is one minus A, so it doesn't give me any extra information. So I can pretty much assume that my deployment invariant is the first component. So I can talk about deployment invariant here to be zero. Zero, one third, two third, and one, uh, where that deployment invariant is the fraction of the point in the upper semi So keep this in mind, four cycles, A, B, C, D. Now let's take a quick look at how they show up in the parameter space of cubic polynomials. So let's take a look at the space of the family of uh, cubic polynomials uh, with a fixed point of a given multiplier theta at the origin, a neutral fixed point. Uh, and let's normalize that so that they're monic. So uh, it's a one complex parameter family parameterized by this uh, coefficient a, which is a complex number. So f sub a is this polynomial. Theta is fixed. It's a fixed real number. And f sub a and f sub minus a are affinely conjugate. So we expect to, if I show you the picture of the a plane, we expect this picture to have a 180 degree center. And this is the picture when theta is 2 thirds. So the center of the picture is 0, a equals 0. And then everything is symmetric around this point. And you see various. Uh, uh, components of the interior, you see copies of the number of set, and there is a rather good understanding of what's happening here in terms of the components and its relation to the actual uh, rabbit. But here, I want to focus on the relation between this parameter space and uh, rotation sets and the deployment invariant. So if you pick any A in this plane, it corresponds to a cubic polynomial with a parallel fixed point at the at the origin with uh, rotation number two thirds, multiplier e to the two pi i two thirds. So because it's cubic, this parabolic point either has three or six rays landing on it. So the angles of rays landing at this parabolic fixed point at the origin either form a three cycle or a pair of uh, three cycles under uh, multiplication by three. And they are minimal rotation sets, that's easy to check, and therefore they have a deployment invariant. So the question is, uh, depending on where I am in this, uh, in this parameter space, how can I compute my deployment invariant? What is the relation between? So it's a deployment invariant is a function on this, on this slice. So uh, what is the geometry of the fibers of this? real bounded function. And it turns out that this is, the, this is what's happening. So what's happening is that you have three uh, degenerate parabolics here. Uh, at these three parameters, uh, at each of them, you have four external rays. Uh, these are parameter rays landing. And then they subdivide the plane into sectors, and then when you look at delta, remember delta is the first component of the deployment vector. When you look at delta, delta is zero here, 
and then it's one third here, and then so here as you go from down towards the top of the picture, delta increases gradually. So let me just uh, draw your attention to what happens in terms of the cycles, and then that immediately translates into values of delta. So in this region, uh, the cycle is A. Remember A, B, C, D here? So these four cycles, A, B, C, D of increasing delta. So here, so in this region, if you pick any parameter, uh, the corresponding cycle for the parameter uh, for the parabolic fixed point is A, and in this region it's B, and in this region it's C, and in this region it's D, and then there are some overlaps where you have A union D, B union C, and C union D. These are compatible so that their union form uh, their unions form uh, rotation sets, and therefore when you look at the uh, corresponding deployment invariant, here you get zero, here you get one third in this region, here you get two thirds, here you get one, and on the overlap is the average of the two. You have two cycles, so you have to take the average of the two deployment invariants. So you get this uh, very nice picture that shows you this kind of monotonicity as you go from the bottom towards the top, delta increases. And this picture is actually, I mean, there is nothing so special about two thirds. Uh, for any p over q, you have a similar picture. So for example, three fifth, you have five degenerate parabolics, the blue points, and the same picture holds. And then five eight, eight over 13, 13 over 21. And these are uh, rational approximations for the golden mean. And so as we pass from uh, rational theta to irrational theta, we would like to uh, understand what happens. So uh, this picture, I'm not sure how well you can see so something is going on in the middle here. Is that visible? OK. So those uh, degenerate parabolics that tend to uh, uh, proliferate as you increase Q, eventually they seem to converge to this uh, uh, object in the middle of this picture. Now this object, for bounded type rotation numbers, we can prove that this is actually an embedded arc. So this uh, blue thing here is an embedded arc from this point, which is one square root of uh, three lambda, lambda mean e to, to pi r theta, to the other square root of it. And it's passing through the origin somewhere here. And uh, this arc can be characterized as the locus. So since the rotation number is uh, bounded type, every such cubic has a Siegel disk centered at the origin. And we know that the Siegel disk has a nice uh, boundary, which is a quasi-circle. And it contains at least one, or maybe both critical points on uh, the, the boundary of the Siegel disk. Now, this arc is the locus of all cubics uh, in this family, such that both critical points is on the boundary, uh, are on the boundary of, of the Siegel disk. So that's one characterization of this arc. So, you have both critical points on the boundary of the Siegel disk along this arc. There are other characterizations. For example, you can prove that the boundary of the Siegel disk, as you move in this parameter space, uh, moves continuously. And it moves holomorphically away from this curve. So as you cross this curve, the boundary of the Siegel disk doesn't undergo any bifurcation or anything. So it's continuous, but it's not holomorphic. You cannot extend that holomorphic motion uh, in the complement of the spark through that part. Uh, another characterization for this part is that so you have a holomorphic motion away from the spark, 
the Siegel disk has a conformal radius everywhere in this picture. Log of the conformal radius is a harmonic function, which is, I think, subharmonic. Minus log is subharmonic. So uh, when you take a look at the generalized Laplacian of that subharmonic function, that arc is the support of that measure. So that measure has no support outside. And that's exactly the support. So what happens, so the question is, how does this picture relate to the deployment data? So for each Siegel disk here, we have an associated counterset of angles of rays that land on the boundary. So in other words, to each parameter in this slice, I can associate a counterset, a minimal counterset, which is invariant on the angle triplet. It's a rotation set. Now, one thing that we can prove as a preliminary step is that as I go from this point to this point, uh, so you see here, at this end, the two uh, critical points collide. So there is a double critical point on the boundary of the Siegel disk. And as I move gradually from this point to the center, the two critical points uh, get farther and farther apart until at the center they're symmetric. And then as I move on, they meet each other again at the top of the curve. Yeah. And you can show that this curve has a sort of natural parametrization in terms of the conformal angle between the two critical points. Now what happens is that that conformal angle, which you can think of as an angle between 0 and 1, turns out to be exactly the deployment invariant of the associated caps. So already, as you move along this curve, this picture gives you a full catalog of every possible rotation set of that given rotation number. Uh, more or less in the same way as you go around the boundary of the main cardioid of the metabolism and you see all of the, those various rotations. Yes. You do know that. Yes, yes. Mon yes. But that's new, yes. right? It's not new. I can give you a reference later, but it's true. Um, and from that, it also follows that the deployment of Miriam is mounted because it coincides with the angle. Now, what about uh, outside this curve? So it turns out that this is the the picture that we should expect. So this picture shows you uh, the value of delta on various uh, sectors. So along this arc, uh, there are many capture components. And the roots of these capture components would define these uh, waves. And it turns out that the deployment invariant is constant on each of these waves. In other words, as long as you uh, move your parameter inside each of these waves, your counter set is fixed. It doesn't change. So it's uh, like a mode blocking behavior. Um, and again, you have this monotonicity. Delta is zero here. And as you gradually go from here to up there, delta increases uh, in a monotonic fashion. Now, the difference between these parameters and other parameters, for example, things that line on the landing at a non-loop uh, on, the, on, the, on that curve is that the counter sets uh, here and these uh, waves have the property that, well, these are irrational rotation numbers. So we know that uh, of the two major, uh, major gaps, one of them is definitely taught. The other one must be loose. While for any other parameter outside the union of these waves, uh, you have a pair of uh, major gaps of length like one third. So the both of them are one. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Good. So let me just mention uh, something very quickly. So in the original proof of uh, Goldberg and the rational case of Goldberg, Tresser and the irrational case, the two 
arguments are very different. One is purely combinatorial. The other one has elements related to uh, uh, fairy trees. And I 